This is episode 14 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and joining me on the show tonight is Cheryl Stewart. Cheryl, thanks for talking Oilers hockey with me tonight. Well, thank you. I've been looking forward to this. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was a great meeting you at the Oilers Live Cup in February, and I'm glad we could uh, chat a little more because I just met you briefly on the bench after the game. I don't know if you remember right. that. Yeah, I do remember it, actually. Yeah, yeah. you, you, li- you, you were lived... Win- you were on the winning team with my son. Yes, yeah, I I talked to him a little bit on the bench, and um, yeah, you, you lived up to your your Twitter uh, handle as the hug specialist because you <laughs> you gave me a hug right away. So I thought, oh, that's she's a, a very sweet lady. Hey, listen, this COVID's killing me because it's not a hug hug uh, friendly. So oh, that's you know what that's true. We're not even doing handshakes right now. I know, I know. <laughs> It's, it's crazy how quickly things changed because that was only about two weeks before the NHL shut down for the past two months now. So, you know, at, at the time, we had no idea this was coming and how different our lives have been since then, right? It's been just incredible. We're living a whole different lifestyle, I'll tell you. Oh, absolutely. Some of it I don't mind. Some of it I don't mind. But um, for the most, I mean, because I work in an essential service, so I've had to continue working. So it hasn't made that much difference for me. Okay. But both my husband and my son got laid off because of it. So Yeah, that's happening to a lot of people and you know, hope hopefully we'll all be back to somewhat normal life in the next couple months here as we, you know, get a, a little bit closer to getting this under control. I hope so. I hope so. But uh on a on a more positive note, you know, it was a it was a lot of fun getting to play in the Oilers Live Cup at the Edmonton Community Arena and uh, you know, more importantly, we raised a lot of money for a very important cause, the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Uh, tell me, how did you get involved with it and uh, helping organize the, the event? Well, I'm part of um, Omega Thread during Oiler Hockey, which I desperately miss right now. Um, and I have been for the last couple of years. And so on game days, particularly, uh, we would all get together on Twitter and make comments about the game and carry on. And it was run by Mike Dursa, who... Mm-hmm. Um, decided with, um, God, I can't think of the other guy, Mike, Michael's last name. Um, hey, Bear? Yes, sorry. Um, so they had hooked up together a couple of, about 18 months ago, I guess now, and said that they wanted to do a charity hockey game. Um, there was a fella from Lethbridge whose son was autistic, and he was going to be up here. So the first one they did was um, a, a small effort because we really didn't know what we were doing, or they didn't, you know, we didn't really have it very well organized. But they were looking for hockey players, and I was a hockey mom for a great many years with my youngest son, and I miss it being a hockey mom. So I volunteered him to play. And so the first game they played in, and they raised a little bit of money for um, autism, and it worked well. Um, The next game they played was last summer when um, Adam, uh, another young man who unfortunately passed away on Christmas Day this year, Mm -hmm pancreatic cancer it was his birthday and he had hoped to play in that game but he was unable to so we celebrated his birthday and we had another game um at the community center at, at rogers and again had or what no i'm sorry it wasn't it was down in mill woods i think anyway whatever we, we they had a second game and again i volunteered my son to play um but at that point i think people started to realize that we had a good core group of people who really were interested in doing this kind of thing, loved hockey, and looked at it as per- perhaps a potential fundraiser for somebody. Um, and Michael uh, decided to use the Heart and Stroke because his dad had, had had some problems. And he started putting it together, and his wife and uh, Mike Dursa and his girlfriend really started moving in on it and gathered a few more people from the Mega Thread. And I was sort of a late arrival on it, but we did some fundraising. We did uh, some ask, requests for um, auction uh, auction items, which went extremely well. And overall, then you know they ended up having more players than they needed, but uh, it was a really huge success. And we ended up raising over ten thousand dollars. So our goal next year is to make it even better. And uh, hopefully we can. I'm not going to say we're going to double it. I won't go that far, but at least maybe add another five or six thousand dollars onto it. And that would be just amazing. And I really, you know, admire Michael for 
taken the time and the effort for putting this all oh. together and, and all the volunteers who've come together and make this event what it really is. Uh, you, you know, we, we, uh, both run podcasts on his channel here on the Oilers live channel. So, uh, I've, you know, I, I've got to see this guy and what he, what he puts into it. And it's just absolutely amazing. And I, I've been lucky enough to play in two of the games, one in Calgary last April and the, and the most recent one, I wish I could have come out last summer in July when they did the, the game for Adam, but yeah. unfortunately I couldn't get the time off work to, to come out. I'd already booked summer vacation. So it was kind of, it was kind of like a last minute thing, but, uh, don't you hate it, when, don't you hate when, uh, work crashes into your personal life? And you're just <laughs> better? <laughs> yeah. And you know, I'm not too far away. I'm in Saskatoon, so oh. I'm only, I'm only about a five and a half hour drive away. But and and the roads are way easier to make in July than they are in January. I'll yeah. tell you that. So, it was uh, it, it wouldn't have been that that hard to get there. Just unfortunately, the the time didn't work. But I, I hope to play in more events going forward. And like you said, it, the more we can grow this, the better. Yeah, and we were really hoping to do a, a, a game in uh, in July again for Adam's birthday. And actually have his wife and daughter come and maybe drop the puck and at least let them see in person the, the cup that was created in his name and what have you. But that's going to happen. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that hockey season one way or another is going to get restarted. And when it does, the rest of the rec hockey and everything else will start moving in again and we'll organize something really quickly. Oh, absolutely. And uh, just before we move on, did your uh, grandson really enjoy the event? And was this the first one he had played in as well? Oh, no, it's my son. Oh, your son, sorry. <laughs> too far, Eric. <laughs> your son, sorry. Son, yeah. So, yeah, no, the, he's played in uh, three of the four games. So um, he played in the very first one. He didn't go to Calgary. I think, no, actually, I think there's been two games in Calgary. And uh, he didn't play in either one of the Calgary games. But um, he's played here and all of the games here in Edmonton. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, oh yeah. And, and like you, you spoke about Mike Dursa before too. He's uh he's another really great guy and uh, I enjoy being in his mega threads too. And uh, I've had him as a guest on the podcast and would love to have him back too. I, I think he and Michael are actually doing quite a few podcasts themselves right now. A lot of the live streams. And I think they've actually, if I saw on Twitter tonight, they're trying to get George LaRock yeah. booked for next they, week. So that, they, that would be awesome. They, booked i think they did get him booked as a matter of fact so that would be perfect yeah because anytime you can get a a former oiler to come on that just elevates the show even more and uh george larock's a fan favorite so i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people tuning in for that one that would be good he is a neat fella oh for sure and um i'd like to go back a, a little further now and just sort of find out more about you um how did you get involved uh, in hockey and become a fan of it? Did you grow up in a hockey family or did you sort of gravitate towards it and become a fan on your own? I didn't grow up in a hockey family, but I loved hockey. And I'm not too sure how that really worked because uh, you got to remember, I'm over 70. Now. And uh, so for the golden days, um, you know, my dad and mom taught me how to skate in our backyard when I was really small. But I loved hockey, and I grew up in a, on a street that was all boys that were my age. So I didn't think they would really play with dolls very much, so I learned to do <laughs> what he did. And uh, so I played baseball and hockey and all the rest of it. And, and I remember my grandma teaching me how to make Star Weekly magazines into shim pads uh, so I could play hockey, because she said that's what they did when they were growing up. Oh, and, wow. And so we, I played road hockey all the time I was growing up. I was an athlete in, in uh, track and field, but at that time, girls weren't really allowed to play on sports or anything like that. So um, I loved, I don't want to even admit this anymore, I loved the Leafs at the time because I lived in <laughs> Toronto. And, oh, you grew um, up in Toronto. I grew up in Toronto, and I was an usher at the gardens for a number of years in my teens. No teams. way. Um, got to see the first Beatles show when I was 15 years old, so that was kind of awesome. But, but I loved hockey, and uh, I was a big Frank Mahovlich fan. And again, we're going back a great many years. But at the time when I was a teenager, a lot of the hockey players had fan clubs, 
And I started one for Frank Mahovlich. And um, actually, there was a big article in the Toronto Telegram. I just came across it the other day. On my birthday, they had offered me some pictures. We did a newsletter. We had over 500 members from all over the world that would write in. And I think, I, I don't even think we charged any money. And then we would send out these newsletters. I don't know where, I guess my father financed it. I don't know. I can't remember because I was 16 or something. But um yeah, so I, I grew up loving hockey, and when we moved to Alberta, obviously it was the year the Oilers um, started to become the Oilers, I guess you'd say, in 19, uh, I was here the first year, well, I was here in 78, and then in 79 when... They joined the NHL. Yeah, so... So, yeah. um... I, I'm not a Leaf fan anymore, though. Make no, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. Um... Yeah, they're they're not a popular team no. among Oilers fans, so that's that's kind of funny. Uh, I want to get back to that in a second, but I, I wanted to ask that that first Beatles comp, uh, uh, concert you went to, were you working at it or were you? Yeah, so a, I, was a usherette. I was an usherette, and you were an usher for that. Yeah, okay. So was, yeah, and so I was really too young to have been brought on, but they needed extra people, so I was kind of on the list waiting to get accepted kind of deal so they brought in a few of us that was the neatest day to this minute i can remember us running around maple leaf garden and waving our hands out the windows in the higher higher windows and people out down below would scream and carry on and <laughs> we'd run to another window and do the same thing we had a ball that day <laughs> now is that the famous concert that over a million people claim that they've been to Oh, likely, likely. But I, I think I've really... I've heard that 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 there's a con that their first concert at Maple Leaf Garden. There's like, yeah. I think it was actually one of my uh, instructors when I went to a sports journalism college in Toronto a, a few years ago had told me that story that there's like a a, a million people who who said that they they've actually been to it, oh, but yeah. very few have the ticket stubs to to prove oh. they were there. Well, I don't. Have ticket stubs but I sure as hell can tell you a lot of things that happened that day so um you know I'm I am telling the truth and if my parents were yep. here they would do the same thing so it uh, one of the neatest things was um the experience and and again I've been to many many concerts since but nothing like that one where the lights went down and then flash bulbs started going off because again remember it's not cell phone time it was cameras with flash bulbs and the yeah. flash bulbs started going off as the stage lit up and they came on singing and it was like unbelievable I, you know it was just and when the people all screamed during those concerts I mean I was working obviously I, I couldn't scream but you wanted to <laughs> like it was one of those things that just the whole crowd thing you know you you really wanted to get into it so it was it was quite an experience oh that's especially an awesome a, story especially for a 15 year old girl right like, I mean, yeah oh <laughs> understandably um i i haven't spent that much time in toronto like my sister lives there now and i will go out and visit her every once in a while and i i spent about nine ten months there for for grad school but i was in sort of the greek greek town danforth area do, do you yeah. sort of know that yeah, was that I sort of near where you were or? um i grew up well i originally uh, was born and, and grew up my mom had been born and grew up in cabbage town which is um, now quite a tourist, uh, touristy, artistic kind of place. But it was um, just south of Bloor, and it would be Parliament okay. and Wells, which is the area. St. Jamestown was there, that kind of thing. So I grew up when, for the first few years of my life down there. Then my parents moved out to Scarborough, and that's where I lived until I moved out on my own when I was about 17. So Okay. Yeah, and then I was I back down to St. Jamestown, so I was right back into where I was in the beginning. So. Okay. Well, the, the residence where I lived for most of my time there was uh, in Scarborough. So I know the area a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, it was a bit of a commute getting all the way down to the Danforth right. every day. Yeah. Um, so when you when you moved uh, to Edmonton, d d was it your whole family that came out or did you just come out on your own? I had a five-year-old son at the time, well, okay. have, but he's a lot older now. Yeah. And, um, and so him and I moved out here. Okay. So when you first came to Edmonton, was it hard to kind of shake that Leafs fandom or did you sort of immediately jump on to becoming an Oilers fan? I think we jumped on pretty fast because, you know, they were such a young team and an exciting team and it was all brand new here. So it was, you know, in Toronto, I loved Toronto when I was growing up and I loved being in Toronto during the 60s and 70s, Yorkville and all those kind of places. But then I became a mom and I had to be do mom things. And so when I came out here, it was a new start. 
So um, it wasn't hard to get involved with the Oilers because they were all, I mean, I don't know how they, how Wayne Gretzky is in his fifties. Like that's not possible, but you know. <laughs> Almost, I, well, one year away from 60 actually I know, now. I, that's freaking scary, but, but you know, <laughs> and they were all really young kids and they were all energetic and, and the whole, you know, the whole thing was so brand new that, and I had a little boy who loved hockey and uh, ironically he played um, community hockey that first winter i was trying to think back it's first winter and the one of the coaches was actually one of the lawyers for the oilers um at the time and i don't know if he was a lawyer team or individual players but um i remember my son didn't have very good skates because i was a, you know i was a single mom and didn't have very much money and had just moved out here and uh he said oh i have a pair of skates at home and he gave my son like a brand new pair of whatever kind of sh- skates kids wore back then and uh, so, you know, he he got into a team that knew something about hockey. So he was, you know, he had a good coach right from the very start. Um, so, yeah, we, we just got swept up in it, I guess you could say, in, in terms of the Oilers. And I've been an Oiler fan ever since. So That's awesome. And, you know, it, it's so important that people in the hockey community help each other out like that. And there's, mm-hmm. I'm sure, a million stories just like that of someone – stepping up and doing something to make a, a kid's experience better and, and to give them a chance to play hockey. So uh, it, it's people like that who are, who are, I think the real hockey heroes that oh. seldomly get talked about. No question. No question. And they were really good people. And, you know, and he, I remember he brought Glenn Sather in to give the kids their trophies at the end of the year. Oh, and awesome. He just thing, you know, like it was just incredible for all the kids to have had that happen. So when, you arrived in, in, in 78, right? Yeah. So yeah. the same year Wayne Gretzky arrived with the WHA Oilers. Uh, do you remember the first Oiler game you went to and what your early impressions of seeing this young, skinny, but uber-talented player were a, 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 in those days? Well, you know, I, I, I think that it was the whole team. I, like, I, I mean, Wayne was something else, of course. But I think the whole team was such a unique young bunch of kids really that um played so well together and had fun doing it and you know i mean i do remember certain games um that wayne played that were just phenomenal and you knew that if he had a puck taken away from him in the first period that team was dead in the third you know because he was just going to decide no i'm not going to take this anymore and he would just put on a show and so i do remember seeing him do that numerous times and over the years but I think what I remember the most it wasn't even a game here I don't think no I, I'm sure it wasn't I think it was when and you probably can remember hockey like my husband and my son do but I think it was in new uh, the island against the islanders and the players were on the bench and they started singing uh here we go oilers here we go and I, I mean I think it was one of the first well, I think it was the first year that they had a run at the Cup, but they didn't win. They lost that year. But I remember that happening and just thinking that was the neatest thing I'd ever seen because here's a bunch of teenage kids saying, <laughs> oh, screw you guys. You know, you guys have been around for a long time and, you know, a really powerful team, but we're going to we're gonna fix this. And I, I, just I haven't that. heard that story. That's I, interesting. Well, yeah, just vaguely I remember it. Maybe maybe it's just my memory that's making it up, but I'm sure <laughs> it really happened. And, and you know, it, it but I'm sure it was in the island when it happened, like not here okay. in Edmonton. So, Yeah, and um, the, oh, there's so many questions I want to ask you because, for I mean, Wayne Gretzky is my ultimate hero. And yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so we got cut off there. I just wanted to pick it up where we left off. I, I was going to say, uh, obviously, Wayne Gretzky is an idol to millions of Canadians, especially in Edmonton. And just getting the chance to watch and play must have been so special. I I wish that I could have watched that era. I wasn't born until 1989. So (laughs) my my mom was pregnant with me when the trade happened. And I was born, I guess, five months after the trade. So I I unfortunately missed out on this great era of hockey. Um, For but even though like I can go back and watch countless documentaries and read all the books to to have seen it live even to watch the videos on youtube to to have seen it live must have been such a special experience for someone my age or younger just what can you say about what how special that era was well 
again, I think that um, it was a whole different breed of hockey than what it is now, because it wasn't all the the speed and the high skills that we see of, and Connor and, you know, the rest of the young guys that are out there right now. I mean, there was talent, obviously. Oilers had a whole lot of it, um, but and so did a lot of other teams. But it was a different kind of hockey. It was it was more, you know, bang, banging, crashing, and the fights were real and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and it was a, it wasn't, it was fast paced. I don't even know how to explain it when I'm trying to think about how to explain it, but it's fast paced, but it was a different kind of fast pace. It's not that skill where Connor takes off and he's like 90 feet ahead of everybody else in three strides. The whole back and forth was constantly fast. And a little more flow to the game. Maybe perhaps. that's what it is. And, and of course, we didn't have as many penalties as we do now, um, or at least it didn't seem that way. And they were probably all against us anyway. <laughs> you um, you but, could get away with so much. I mean, I'm watching some of these old games on Sportsnet now that they're re showing because there's no NHL. And you see tons of hooking and holding calls that the refs don't even look twice at. So, you know, it seems like they got away with a lot more back then. We, oh, they definitely did. And, you know, we were watching one the other night, and it was from, like, 1987 or something, and Oilers yeah. started. And I cheered in my living room. I thought, oh, <laughs> that was, like, 30-some-odd years ago, but I still cheered. <laughs> no, I was – it's funny. I was um, over having dinner with my parents uh, last night, and they had the a playoff game between Edmonton and Calgary from 1983 on. Mm-hmm. And my parents are – both in their early sixties now, and I was joking with them that this is this game was back when they were both still young, so they <laughs> they didn't yeah. think that was as funny. But they, uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was fun to watch those old games and uh, see Gretzky score seven points against Calgary in the playoffs it was awesome. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I yeah, think was, I think the personalities of the players came through more. Like I think that now so many of them are under contracts at such young age, like like Connor is, for instance, with Upper Deck, um, that they don't have the same freedom that the players back then had. And the other interesting thing is, again, you know, knowing some of the things I know that happened off the ice, amazing, none of it hit the press. You know, like the press kind of stayed back and they all knew, like everybody knew what was going on. But, and I don't mean really horrible, horrible things, but just the freedom that the players, not just the Oilers, but all of them, I think, had been compared well, to what it is now is so different. I don't even know how you could compare the two. Yeah, like, and I mean, these that. are these are young, wealthy athletes. Oh. Uh, and this was in a time when there was no social media. Yeah. There's no there's no camera phones. There, you know, the 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 things that would go on outside of the arena in you know, wherever, bars, parties, whatever, any of that stuff was all word of mouth, right? It, none, none, there was no there was no hard uh, evidence of the wildness that might have been going on in anything. But, um, I mean, look, I'm sure that some of these young NHL players today still like to cut loose every once in a while and, and all that. But at, I think that they just have to be a lot more careful now because – it, it always seems that it, one small slip up and the whole world's going to be on top. And like Connor doesn't even like to be photographed with a, a drink in his hand. Oh, I know. I know. If you, I've seen his Instagram and there will be pictures where uh, he's hanging out with his girlfriend and a couple other friends and they'll all be holding just a, a beer or uh, yeah. some, some drink. And, and Connor has like set his down. So it's like, so he doesn't get photographed because he is a role model. And I think that, that that's one thing that I think he and Wayne had such in common. And, and there's, there's a bunch of similarities between them. They're, they're almost cut from the same cloth in, in, in a mm-hmm. sense, but they, they both have recognized from a young age, the responsibility that comes with being a Wayne Gretzky or being a Connor McDavid. I was just going to say responsibility is such a huge word. And I think that's so true, you know, um, and I think that, you know, I think back in the day, if you will, you know, I mean, there was more freedom, as you said, because there was no social media and people did things that 
you know, you just did and, and carried on and whatever. And I mean, the players, even when they won the Stanley Cup and they, they brought it out to the Bruin Inn here in St. Albert and, you know, they, they traveled around with it in different restaurants in, in Edmonton, you know, and they left it places and all those kind of things, which, you know, you hear about. And I, as I recall, and, and again, you're more of a historian probably than I am in terms of it, but I recall that there was an incident when it would have been the era of Wayne and Mark and, and Kevin and that bunch is that I sound like I know who I'm, they're good. Friends <laughs> no, it's all good. Call them by their first name. <laughs> um, we feel I, like we do know them. We do. Yes, exactly. Um, is that at the time there was an incident and I don't remember what it was. And I don't know that it specifically had to do with the Oilers, but Eva Pockington brought in people and Glenn brought in people to talk to the players about being in public and I think it was another team had got themselves you know there had been some incident happen or whatever and I remember at the time uh, Eva Pockington brought in a speaker to teach them how to speak properly um, when they're talking to the pub, uh, to the press and what have you and then they also brought in I guess safety kind of if you will safety kind of people that would talk to them about being in public and I remember at the time that was really quite unique and I, I it was something that you know, I was just a little bit older than they were, but, you know, I thought that was a really neat thing to do. And I've, I've wondered since then, is it something that's just automatically continued? And probably most teams do, because you can tell now that those players are pretty, you know, uh, coached, if you will, and in terms of, you know, speaking to the media and things like that. But, um, you know, almost too controlled sometimes. But Absolutely. They're almost, they're, they're so polished now that, you know, they, they don't want to, make one slip up or say no. anything that could be controversial. And, exactly. and I, I think that there is a balance there. Like, like I, I do appreciate that they are so conscious about their public image and that they do want to present the, the best version of themselves. But at the same time, it, it is sometimes good to see a little personality. And that's why I kind of like it. The odd time a reporter will ask Connor a question and he'll kind of give uh, just a little bit of a snarky answer back to him. And and it, and then you'll see all the other media guys kind of chuckle. And, and I, I really like those moments when he sort of lets his guard down. Yeah, exactly. Well, and then you get somebody like Zach Cassian, who will just tell you what it is. And I mean, I just love Zach. So, yeah. Know, I mean, he well, steps on the line sometimes too, but <laughs> don't we all, you know? Yeah, look how he talked about uh, Matt Kachuk back in January. He wasn't shy about his feelings at all. Uh, well, I think that if he'd listened to Twitter or watched Twitter the last few days after that situation, he would have probably got a lot of new words to be able to say. But... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure. And, you know, uh, you, you said so many great things before that about uh, the Oilers uh, and their early cup days. Uh, actually, I have questions f for you about that earlier, so I'm, I'm even getting ahead of myself here. But uh, I, I do want to just tie it back before I, I forget anything. When did you actually become a, a season ticket holder for the Oilers? So my husband has been a season ticket holder since the beginning. He had WHA okay. tickets, and then he had Oiler tickets. And I came on the scene just shortly after I came here, and um, and so have been a kind of a part of it since then. So, did you split them with anyone? I know a lot of people oh, have done that. The last few years we did. Um, I, the first couple of years we did, or he did, and then um, the last few we did because we just couldn't afford it. And you know, you realize that. We were, I was trying to think this the other, when, when we first gave, talked about giving up our seats. Um, at that time, I think he had, he had bought them when he was in his early 30s. And, you know, they were, I mean, they were expensive then compared to in, in my, how much money you made and all that kind of stuff. But um, when you're in your 70s trying to pay what now is becoming the norm of what the cost was when it moved to Rogers, it just was getting ridiculous. Right? Oh. I mean, I, look, I, I'm in my early 30s now, too. And, and I'll tell you, I, I know that I wouldn't be able to afford the tickets. No. Uh, you know, I try to come out to about three or four games a year. Yep. And I, I mean, for me, th there's the added expenses, right, of, you know, okay. yep. $50 of gas one way, $50 back, a hotel room for a couple nights, all the, the food. Like, uh, you know, so there's... It's not it's not as easy as just like driving from your house to the game or taking a, a an Uber or a cab or something. So that that's an, an added expense. But even if I lived in Edmonton, I, I still know that the, the price of the tickets right now is expensive. So I can understand why anyone might not want to re up them uh, yeah. at the price there, even though how 
incredible of a time this is. Like I, you, I know. If, if you if you have the money and you're able to go, I fully understand why you would because after all the people who stuck through a, a difficult ten years of Oilers hockey to finally be rewarded with what we're seeing on the ice more most recently, you know that's that's a reason to come to the rink. And but it's sad. And again, you know, to take it off the ice. Um, I mean, a great part of why we decided to give up when we did was because of what was happening off the ice with the management and the treatment of people and the treatment of players as well as the fans, um, because that wasn't what you had back in the beginning. Um, I, I mean, I can remember having many conversations with Peter Pockington at, at Rexall. Um, he'd wander around the halls and he saw him talk to you. And, and you know, he was a very pleasant person to talk to and, and knew his hockey and, and was more than welcome to stop and he'd stop and talk to anybody. And um, and then when the, was it 16 or 20 people from, um, you know, rich families, I guess, or rich corporations or whatever, when they bought out the team because we were going to lose it kind of thing after um, Hockington gave up on it. My husband played hockey with one of the fellas and, and he um, oh, wow. played hockey for years with him. And uh, so, again, they would wander through the hallways and, and you'd see them. They weren't, they weren't stashed away in Hawaii or wherever, you know. Mm-hmm. They were front and center and they would talk to you about hockey. And if you had some concerns, you know, you'd say it to them and, and you would get some kind of reply. And so it was a very personal kind of, you felt like you were part of the team, I guess you could say, a season ticket holder. And, and that was not just because I was a season ticket holder, because I think they did it with everybody. I mean, we didn't wear badges if they were season ticket holders. So, you know, anybody that was at Rexall, um, you know, they would stop and talk, and, and they were invisible, and they were always around. And that, it was a huge difference, because you, you felt like they everybody was part of the same community. Well, that's that's awesome. And, you know, I think that was... I I remember even Mark Messier speaking in his uh, retirement jersey uh, speech in Edmonton, saying how how big a part of the community the whole team was. And I and I'd like mm-hmm. to think that I'd like to think that the organization is is in the right uh, position right now with Ken Holland kind of leading the way at least from a hockey front. Yeah. And 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 hopefully that uh, the rest of the organization can can follow suit. But um, obviously there was a lot of disdain and and for Peter Pocklington in the late 80s after the Gretzky trade Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of people forget that he was the one who brought Gretzky to Edmonton in the first place Uh, and while the city of Edmonton likely thought that Wayne would be theirs forever uh, they at least had his 10 best years I would say uh, in in the in the the city of Edmonton so uh, when when they did trade Gretzky and there are things I still want to get, I feel like I'm jumping all over the place, but I, I know where there's so many great topics that I'm thinking of from what you're saying. Uh, when, when they did trade Gretzky, did you, did you despise Pocklington like a lot of Edmontonians or, or what, what was your mindset at the time when all that craziness was going down? I probably hated him just about as much as everybody else did at the time. Um, and, and you're right. You know, he did bring, but it, those kind of things you forget when they trade away somebody like that. I mean, again, for people now, just imagine if, God forbid, I don't even want to say it, but you know, if Connor, if somebody said, well, we're going to trade him to wherever um, and we're getting back so and so and so and so and so, it wouldn't make any difference. We'd all hate whoever made that decision, like up the yin yang and back again. Um, And I think that was the thing because they had won the Stanley cup that spring and, you know, it was all, great and then there was sort of this thing was happening and I don't even remember it was sort of this rumor that was going out around around and and we had kind of we had heard it a few times that he was going to get traded um <clears throat> and you know no no that can't be possible kind of thing and the morning it happened I was working at the time for uh, the MLA here in St. Albert and I remember the newscast came on and they announced it and I locked myself, I locked the door of the office and I was bawling my eyes out. I like, I just was a basket case and I couldn't answer the telephone and do anything for about an hour. Um, and so it was a very painful day for everybody. And it's, I don't even know what you could compare it to now, really and truthfully, um, because I mean, who would want to even think of any of the ones we have, the guys we have now on our team. Won't <laughs> but, I mean, it just was so like, how 
how could you trade away someone who's given so much to your community and and yeah. so much of our lives? And we were all, as I say, I was a few years older, but we were sort of all in that same age group, if you will. And it was like, holy crapish, you know, and our kids were heartbroken. And it's just, it was crazy, you know, to, to think that someone could do that. Uh, and I know it's a business. I understand all of that. Yeah, stuff. and and Wayne Wayne didn't want to renegotiate at the time. He wanted to wait until the end of the season. But obviously, they the franchise couldn't take that risk. As well as, I think that uh, the the financial troubles that we've later come to find out about Peter Pocklington was a, a reason that the trade also was made so that he would get the fifteen million US to sort of prop up some of his struggling businesses at the time. Yeah. yeah. But uh, this wasn't, I don't, I don't I, maybe it was, but I don't think it was common knowledge that that was a big reason why the trade was happening. Uh, what what was it like for the rest of your family? Were were they just as shocked and upset as you? Yeah, I mean, everybody was devastated. And, it, you know, it's, it's hard to, again, you know, when you think that now that I'm older and more things have happened and, and all the rest of it, I kind of think, okay, sports are important. But there's a lot of other things that are more important. But on that, of point, course, it didn't feel like it. You know, it. it I think everybody in, the, you know, in certainly in Edmonton was just devastated. And, you know, and, and I mean, it's still one of those things is, do you remember what you were doing on that day? You know, and, and people can automatically tell you exactly where they were and exactly what happened. And it, it was one of those turning points, I guess you'd say. So and it seemed like, well, how do we even like the Oilers? following like i mean who you know like they aren't even going to be the oilers and funny thing they were you know i mean it yeah just, and, know, and they won they another stanley won cup in exactly. they, they 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 got one back in ni- 1990 so at yeah. least they continued to win uh <clears throat> you know that's one of the things i regret the most is that i can only really remember the last few years of wayne gretzky's career Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I only knew him as an LA King or with the the Rangers, really. So to to have seen him play for the Oilers would have been an incredible experience. That's why I'm so lucky. In 2003, when they played the Heritage Classic, yep. uh, I mean, I was 14 years old, glued to the TV, just watching Wayne come out and play at Commonwealth Stadium in in an Oilers jersey for the first time in my lifetime. And then in 2016, when they had the Heritage Classic in Winnipeg again, I was lucky enough to go to that one and actually see Wayne play live for the probably first and only time in my life. So I'll, I'll always cherish that memory and that I, I got to have that experience. You've probably okay. seen him play. P- pardon me? Yeah. I was just going to say with the Heritage Classic, uh, we had tickets and um, we went to the day before uh, they had a practice and we went there and my, my oldest son was living in Jasper at the time, and uh, he came through to go to the game. He had we, him and my his ne- my la, 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 his cousin and my nephew um, both lived in Jasper at the time. I think maybe my daughter was living there as well. But anyway, they all came to the game, and I got so sick from being out in the cold the day before. Oh no! I couldn't go to the game, and they had brought one of their friends in from Jasper who ended up with my ticket. But Doug, who's our youngest one, I think he was only about seven. Or eight. He was born in seventy. Or Doug was in, uh, what year was he born? Ninety-five. So whatever age that was at, from that point. So him and his oh, dad. Eight. Yeah. So he went to the game, sat through that minus whatever it was, and wrapped up in sleeping bags. And uh, so they were all at the game and watched it. And they still talk about it. Every one of them, you know, talk about going. And I think Doug has a T-shirt somewhere downstairs that says, "I survived the Heritage Classic" or whatever. You know, I was at the first Heritage Classic. Because it was so friggin' cold, it was ridiculous. Yeah, I think it was almost minus thirty, wasn't it, with yeah, the wind chill? Yeah, it was cr- well, and that's what it was like the day before. And I just got a chill right through me, and I was so sick, and I was so mad that I couldn't go. Oh, neat seeing them go back out on the end again, you know, and uh, um, and the goalie for Montreal wearing the toque on top of his helmet. Jose Theodore, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm sure it was probably a little easier for the players actually, because at least they were moving around. To be a fan who, especially oh. if you were in, if you were in the upper deck in a in an elevated spot at Commonwealth, to be sitting there in that wind for hours, that must have been just brutal. Yeah, well, that's where they were sitting, and uh, you know, and I, I remember afterwards they had to race to get onto a bus, and they lost one of the sleeping bags, and my nephew, I remember him saying he had never been so cold. 
in all his life. <laughs> you know, it took them all night to get warmed up once they got home. So. Oh yeah, I would have needed to just pile myself under blankets or take a super hot shower just to try and get the blood circulating again. But so you've probably seen Gretzky play countless times though, during his, his heyday in Edmonton yeah, though. Yeah, for sure. For sure we did. And, um, and again, you know, he was part of, it's, it's really hard for me because I loved Gretzky, but I also loved the team. And now I think I'm, I'm, sort of got to that point again but with with the team we have now but I think it wasn't just individual players um, although Wayne was something else I think that whole bunch were just so incredible to watch together because they could they it's like watching what we what people now are watching Leon and uh, Connor is that they know where the other person is on the ice even without raising their head or blinking their eye or anything else that's what that whole core group was like so that every move they made on the ice, the other players would know and they were right in the right spots for like Yari Curry and, and Wayne. And, um, you know, they were right in the right spot. They were so in sync. That's right. Yeah, it's just they... that's the word. Yeah, exactly. It... Um, and that's, I think, what I remember most is that, you know, that four or five particular ones that we talk about all the time. But they were such a core group and they just knew each other so well. And we're such good friends off the ice as well that it it showed, you know, all the time in every game that they played. Oh, absolutely. So when the when you were following the team and and going to games regularly, that must have been a special experience because not every game was on TV at that time, right? So your options were a lot of the time listen to Rod Phillips or the radio or go to the game. So you were probably one of the lucky people who got to see them on a fairly frequent basis. Yeah, we would have, you know, and, and again, it's it's a long time ago. And, you know, it's funny because you got so used to things being the way they are now with TV being, you know, the hockey games being on all the time. I had actually forgotten about that, but you're right. You know, the games weren't always on. And certainly we listened to Rod Phillips. He was something else to listen to. So, you know, he was a lot of fun to listen to. As oh well. yeah. Just a great broadcaster. And uh, as someone who is pursuing that industry as well, I mean, he's, he's a, definitely a person you can look up to and just what a talent. Um, so we, we kind of briefly touched on uh the Stanley Cups uh, a while ago. I, I want to get, tie it back to that. When the Oilers won their first cup in 1984, mm-hmm. what what are your memories from that spring? And and what was what was the city like at the time following the championship win? It was crazy. I, I you know I, what, the thing I remember the most is Jasper Avenue, which is crazy. Driving down Jasper Avenue after they won, um, I mean it was just like a madhouse, and it was. You didn't have fires. You didn't have cars being overturned. You didn't have any of that kind of stuff. You just had a lot of really happy people shaking hands and kissing and, you know, like coming up to cars and high-fiving people and all of that kind of thing. And then the parade bringing the Stanley Cup to City Hall and all of the players very hungover and uh, in their <laughs> in their white suits. Um, yeah. In their convertibles. Um, I've seen the it, video of that of yeah. Wayne in, in his yeah. all white suit. I think he had a pink shirt on too. It looked, yeah. it looked very Miami vice at the time. So. <laughs> oh, we all did. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, but I mean, again, you know, just so many people came out and, you know, remembering tr- that Edmonton wasn't the size it is now, you know, I think probably almost everybody in Edmonton was there at one point or another. Like you said, the million people who attended the Beatles concert. But I <laughs> but I really, really believe that, you know, practically everybody in Edmonton had the opportunity to, um, you know, come out and, and cheer them on and, and see them. And, the, and that was the other key, I think, difference between now and then is the availability of the players. Um they were always around and you saw them, you bumped into them, you know, wherever, but they also made themselves available for the kids. And, yeah. and, you know, like when they had West Ham and Mall first open and the Oilers would go there and, you know, the different things, the different events that it had taken place, um, maybe a few years, maybe more into the 90s, it would have been probably in the 90s, they had a carnival every year that the players were all at and the kids could go and, and see their you know, see their players and in live Pearson people, you know, kind of thing. It's so different. And that to me is what I miss the most as a, as a mom, when my kids were growing up, they were really lucky and they met everybody, but 
say, for instance, my grandkids will never have will never have that kind of opportunity. And, and for sure, you know, it, it's now so different in terms of the availability of the players to the public. You have to hope that that's starting to maybe change a little bit. Like you've seen, they're starting to do more of these autograph sessions at yep. West Edmonton Mall, and they're trying to maybe get back to that a little bit. I wasn't around for uh, that when the Oilers were more accessible in the 80s, so I can't speak to that experience, and I've never been a resident of Edmonton. But uh, just the fact that there's the – I know there's the season ticket holder autograph sessions, but not everyone has access to that. So the fact that they are doing a few more of these events where you can go see Connor and meet him and and see all the other players, I think that's that's really cool. And and I hope that they start doing more events like this. And – uh, I, I just you, I thought of a story you made me think of. Uh, I, I I can recall Kevin Lowe saying in a in an interview a, a, a long time ago that back in the eighties when he and Wayne lived together, they would sometimes go skate at an outdoor rink near their condo or wherever they were living, and that they would skate with the kids out at the outdoor rink. And I mean that would just be phenomenal for any kid to have that experience yeah. to go oh, skate with a hero. For sure, and and um, you know I think that that's something that made that team part of Edmonton, you know, because they were around. And, um, and I, I know my son Doug brought up a point, like he said, mom, there's different people out there now. And, you know, that they have to protect. Of course. Because, you know, it's, it is a different world and it's sad that it is, but it is. Um, but I know that, you know, every, I think we have the, those cards that they gave out at West Edmonton Mall from every year that they ever did it so from wherever they started, you know, early eighties all the way through, I think we've got sets every year and we would line up religiously and, you know, we would strategically, each of our kids would be somewhere else. And, you know, there was rules who you had to go to. And I mean, it was, it was a real, that, that day was planned well ahead to make sure that we got everybody. Right. But so I mean, again, it was fun. And, and, you know, for me, it, as an older person now, and I watch when little kids faces light up when they see the players and periodically they'll show a video on, you know, some player handed the kid a stick or something. And, uh, you know, I'd like to put my name on the sign and go down by Connor and say, could I have your hockey stick? But I don't think you'd give it. (laughs) You know who else? I've talked about this on a previous episode of the podcast too, but when I went to my first Oilers game in 2006, I was 17 at the time. And before the game, I, I think I had seen this on TV before, but I, I, I noticed it live. After the Oilers finished their warm up, Ryan Smith would always gather three pucks, yep. and yep. and he would and he would throw the the pucks to some kids sitting in the the front row who were watching the warm up. And I thought that always was a a really classy thing of him to do. And I'm so fortunate that I was able to meet Ryan Smith a couple of years ago when I was. Uh, working for new cap TV in, in Lloyd Minster. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you now, uh, who are some of the Oiler players you've been lucky enough to meet over the years? Well, Doug Wade is my favorite. Um, oh, but um, one know, of mine is a f- kid too. You just reminded me, you know, Trevor, who's my oldest one, who is now, he'll kill me if I can get this right. Uh, <laughs> he's 40. He'll be 47 this year. Um, so the the year that Pockington signed Wayne uh, at Center Ice, we happened to run into Pockington at Meadowlark Mall, if you can imagine, in Edmonton, um, which at the time was one of the bigger malls. And my Trevor was um, Trevor did acting uh, throughout his young life and still is involved in theater and what have you. So he he has a personality and he's not afraid to talk to people and all this kind of stuff. And I said, "Oh, there's Peter Pockington." And he marched over there, stuck his hand out and said, Mr. Pockington, I just want to thank you for signing Wayne Gretzky to that long, con- long contract because he's my favorite player. And Pockington looked at him and said, well, next time you're at the game, uh, come down to where my seats are and I'll, uh, I'll introduce you to Wayne. And so he ended up sitting with, Wayne, uh, with Peter and Eva um, at one of the games a few, about a week or so later. And they took, Peter took him into the dressing room and he got Wayne Gretzky's stick, which I just took out to him and his, his younger son is a real hockey freak. And so I just took it out to them. They live in Kimberly now, but I just took it out to them. They had a uh, Thanksgiving this year. 
And he sat with Wayne and got pictures taken with both him and, and Paul Clinton. Um, and then he said, you know, like he was thanking them and everything. And so, I mean, you know, he was very lucky again, because we were allowed to go downstairs at Rex Hall. I forget what it was called at the time. I don't know. It wasn't Rex Hall, but uh, it had so many different names over the years. Yeah. Uh, but, but I know that you were allowed to go downstairs. I know there wasn't, again, the, the huge division of, well, we paid $20,000 for a seat. So we're allowed to go downstairs as opposed to 10000 right. uh, that there is now. But um, so all of my kids um, and Brian's kids have been able to um, go downstairs and meet players. And, but Dougie Waite was probably my very favorite. And uh, when we adopted Doug, our youngest one, um, he was just brand new. He was like five weeks old when we got him. And there was a hockey game the next week, and we didn't want to leave him with a babysitter. So we took him to the game with us. And I wasn't a good mom, obviously, because I didn't buy one of those noise channeling things. That oh, the headphones. On their heads. I mean, yeah. Um, but I remember that night, um, Dougie Waite got a hat trick. Oh, and wow. Uh, the fans were all screaming, Dougie, Dougie, Dougie. And this was actually before we officially got to adopt him. He was in our home waiting okay. for all the paperwork to go through. And so we didn't change his name. He had been named Douglas and we didn't change it because my husband was scared we jinx it. So when we came home that night, we told the kids about Dougie Wade getting a hat trick and we had foster kids at the time. And they said, well, Doug Wade has to be his favorite player then. Cause like clearly, you know, like, I mean, that has to be his favorite player. And so about six weeks later, we were at a function with the Oilers at the Crown and Tower. No, Crown and it's it's down by in the ice district. It's a big a piano pub. Um, anyway, they had a Christmas party there, and Doug Waite was there. Well, the all the others were there, and we told Doug about this story, and he said, "Oh well, I'll have to meet him. Yeah, you know, I'll have to meet him." And afterwards, so our Dougie has had pictures taken with Doug Waite from the time he was probably six weeks, seven weeks old, all the way through to I think the last time we saw Doug Waite, he was about fourteen. And I wish that we had been able to make arrangements when Waite was with the Islanders the last couple of years for him to see Doug all growing up. Because even when he was playing the last couple of years we played, we would go to the games. Doug would always go down by the ice when they were warming up and Waite would always come over and hit the glass. Uh, his wife, Allison, was an incredible lady. And she would, a couple of Christmases when we bought jerseys for Doug for Christmas, new jerseys, she would take them in the dressing room and every player would sign them. And so he'd open a Christmas morning and have a, an autographed jersey from the Oilers. Um, and I think he kind of grew up thinking that's just what people got because <laughs> it happened to him his whole life. Plus, he has a gorgeous sister who worked at Lux, which was owned by Ryan Smith. Yeah. And um, so she knew a lot of them. So even <clears throat> towards the last few years that, that he was young enough that he would go to the uh, – the West Edmonton Mall autograph sessions and the lineups were getting longer and longer and longer and you're not able to line up for as many players. She just walked by and waved to them and they go, oh, come over here. And so you'd always get in the back and get an autograph, much to the chagrin of most of the security people. Um, <laughs> and so, again, he kind of grew up a little spoiled because he just figured that was the way it well, was. <laughs> that's an awesome story. And, you know, as, <clears throat> as someone who... Uh, can only really start to remember the Oilers in the late '90s when they were starting to get a little better and go and upset a few teams in the first round of the playoffs. They they would just you know barely sneak into the playoffs and and find a way to just will themselves to victory. Uh, Doug Waite and Ryan Smith were two of my early heroes with the team. Same with guys like Bill Guerin and, yeah. and George LaRock, uh, Curtis Joseph. These were some of the first guys I really followed with the Oilers, and I can remember. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's not on the same magnitude of the Gretzky trade, but in the summer of 2001, I was 12 years old, and they traded uh, Doug Waite to uh, the St. Louis Blues, and that was the, the my was first July real. 1st. Yeah, that was July 1st, wasn't it? I think it was. Wasn't it on July 1st? July 1st, 01, yeah. 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 So that was my first experience with sort of a big trade. Uh, that the Oilers had made other than I guess, well, they lost Curtis Joseph in free agency a few years earlier, but uh, for the Oilers to trade him. And I, I was just really disappointed because this is their, their best player at the time. And it's hard to believe that was almost 20 years ago. Now it doesn't seem that long ago, but uh, when <laughs> I have, uh, I want to talk about the 2006 playoff run in a bit, but uh, was it sort of bittersweet when you, 
saw Doug Waite win the cup with Carolina in 06? Oh, that was a weird year. Like, it was a weird playoffs because Allison came here and we have a Doug Waite. Okay, when Doug Waite got traded to the Oilers from New York, um, he they didn't have time to make up a proper jersey for him. And so he wore number 39. No, he wore number four. Sorry, my apologies. He normally wore 39. He wore 42 for a number of the games. And my husband bought that jersey at an auction um, that sometime later, because we he supported uh, you know all the auctions they'd have, and, and it was a game worn jersey. And so during those playoffs, I had started to wear that jersey at the beginning when Oilers first started getting in, because Dougie was always one of my favorite players. And um, and then when they ended up with Gates Carolina and Doug was on the team, I'm thinking, oh really? Like what am I supposed to do? I can't change jerseys because I would jinx them. And so I had to continue wearing it. And uh, I remember Allison was at Rexall or whatever it was called then. And uh, she, she saw me and I saw her and she said, well, I'm glad to see somebody really still likes Dougie. And I said, well, everybody here does. And, and we were all torn. Um, at that time, social media was sort of starting to really get heavy duty and there was fan pages. And it was interesting because there was none of the cutthroat things on any of the fan pages. We were all kind of this mutual, like, yeah we kind of aren't going to really hate each other kind of deal. It was kind of weird. And so it was really mixed feelings because obviously I desperately wanted the Oilers to win the Stanley Cup that year. And we came so darn close and there were so many things The guys had the flu and it was oh Oh. horrible. And yet at the end, I mean, I know Doug dislocated his shoulder and he couldn't play and, and, you know, but seeing him when he came out on the ice afterwards and it, it still was a good feeling, you know, like it it was kind of weird. Yeah. you know, I, I don't know if I feel the same way now. Like, if I can't think of who's on another team that I used to really like that I could be happy for if they won against the Oilers. But Oh, yeah, I, that would be I, tough. I mean, Pat, I think a lot of Oilers fans were happy for Patrick Maroon last year, but it wasn't, yeah, necessarily, well, I, <clears throat> it wasn't necessarily against the Oilers. Exactly, um, exactly. No, but, uh, I mean, I remember that that 2006 run so, so vividly, and that was my best experience as a hockey fan to date. And I remember I was in grade 11 at the time and that game when they lost game seven, I, I had my, my grade 11 math final exam the next day. And, oh, it was so hard to try and study for that because I, well, first of all, if they would have won, I would have been just going crazy and, and celebrating and just wouldn't have been able to focus on studying anyway. But the fact that they lost, uh, I wasn't able to <laughs> focus yeah. either. So it was like, it was a lose lose for me. And um, once again, it's, it's not on the same level as the Gretzky thing, but then Chris Pronger gets traded about two weeks after the Stanley cup final is done. So it's like, it was sort of similar to 88 in a way that you have this ultimate high of winning the Stanley cup. And then a, the low of lows where yeah. you're trading away. your the greatest player of all time two yeah. two months later. So one of the things that really bothered me, and it's still kind of when Al Shansky just retired a couple of years ago. Yeah, one of my favorite players. I love him too. And we also have a game worn Kensky jersey, which I wear. Oh, that's awesome. But um, one of the things that really bothered me that year, and you're just talking about Pronger, is that when Pronger gave up on the team and left, and of course there was a whole bunch of other things connected to that, Alex signed a long-term contract that same summer. Yeah. And I thought, you know, he's trying to show people that he, there is a team and that they're going to cut. And nobody ever talked about that very they much. They lost a lot of players, too. I think they lost seven players from that Western Conference championship team. And you're right. Hemsky signed that long-term deal and showed his loyalty to the organization. Yeah. And he stayed loyal through eight consecutive non-playoff years. Exactly. So that that's just ultimate dedication and yeah. you know what uh, there's a lot of stuff that i think went on behind the scenes from from what i've heard there's and you don't want to get into the rumor mill too much but i don't think pronger's wife was ever that happy in edmonton no well if you I, had a choice of living in california in the winter in edmonton probably i'd prefer california too right but you know i've i've always oh, thought like cool. you know it's only six months out of your year you can spend the other six months living wherever you want to live does, does it really you know it, yeah if you're if you're on 
a team that has a chance to do something and you're you're with a good group it's just from september until you know hopefully june but obviously you're not going to go to the final every year yeah. you can live wherever you want in the off season but i guess some people want the year round sun and everything so i, I think there's a lot more to the story too so I yeah like obviously saying, uh, May know. maybe they'll make a documentary on it someday <laughs> who knows but i don't know how much pronger wants to discuss that uh, uh, that I think topic times that people have tried to bring it up he's shut it down really fast so i don't you know think... another thing i i i wondered when they did in 2016 when they closed down rexall place mm -hmm. i was wondering if he would have shown up for the the farewell because i think there were over 150 former oilers that came onto the ice after that last right. game yeah. and i i was wondering if he would be there or not but he ultimately i guess chose not to show yeah i guess so you know i hadn't even thought about that but you're right he wasn't i mean there's was a few that didn't and some some legitimately like they're in europe or wherever and you know right I, I, a lot of them had to travel on their own dime um from what i heard but yeah you know i yeah i mean it was a well, like you say, the best of times, the worst of times, I guess, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the high and then the crash. And, and as I say, I really felt, I always felt bad for Alish because I thought, why didn't people recognize that that's what he did that summer when we were all feeling like, holy, you know, like we're being bailed on by Pronger. And here we have a young kid who is more than willing to sign a long-term contract. And it, he never seemed to get that kind of recognition. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, that 2006 run, it, it doesn't feel that long ago, especially for me, because that's that was sort of my first long Oilers playoff run, especially since I you know wasn't around for the glory yeah. days. But there's a whole generation of fans now who don't even remember that 06 run. You would you would you would have had to be I at the very least, I guess, 20 years old to even have the slightest memory. And then how much does a six-year-old really even remember it, right? Yeah. So we're, we're talking about anyone who's a teenager or younger doesn't recall those days. However, maybe they would remember the 2017 run. So 11 years later, the Oilers finally get back to the playoffs, led by McDavid on this incredible season where they finished two points out of first place in division. What, what was... Uh, what, what were you thinking and what was it like in uh, in 2017 when they finally got back to the playoffs? Because I was in Toronto at the time for school. So I was amongst the Leaf fans and constantly hearing about how the Oilers were going to crash and burn and the Leafs were going to go on this long run. So I, I was very satisfied that they at least made it one round further than Toronto did and, and probably should have went further than that if not for some horrible officiating okay. but uh but just tell me what was what was it like uh you know, three years ago when they when they went on that run and, and hopefully we'll get another one soon well i think you know first of all going back to the end of the season when connor was trying to get the 100 points and uh that last game i think he i forget how many he needed but he ended up getting it but it was like one of those crazy like you know you, you held your breath every time he was on the ice because you know, you wanted him to get that point badly and get on there and, you know, be be what we always knew he was going to be kind of deal. And again, that was the first year they were in Rogers, right? Like I'm my brain. Yes, that was yeah. the that was the inaugural so, season at Rogers, yeah. When they moved over to Rogers and our tickets jacked up so high, we thought, Oh God, you know, are we gonna be able to swing this? And we decided we would do one year. And that was, the, of course, that year they decided they were going to go into the playoffs, which tied us in for another few years. But um, but I know that, it, again, it was like every game, like, holy catfish, you know, they're getting stronger and stronger and we're going to do this kind of deal for the first round and second round. Um, but like you said, the, the um, refereeing was just atrocious. And oh. I know the other week there was some somebody – I, I can't remember what it was on Twitter. Somebody had posted a picture of that stupid thing with them holding on to our goalies pads. And I just like, everybody was losing it, you know, cause they had brought up all these horrible memories. And my Facebook messengers message memories that day said, I hate Kessler. I hate. Kessler. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that was all that was on my, like that was the memory. Was, I yeah. Hate Kessler, I hate Kessler. Well, he was the one prying Cam yeah. Talbot's pads yeah. open and, I, I mean, look, anyone can say that we're biased fans and that uh, we're looking at it through Oilers colored glasses. But 
I, I try to take myself out of it. And I've showed this to friends of mine who aren't fans of the Oilers. And I say, what would you say here? Like, and my dad officiated hockey for 25 years and, and he was watching it too. He said that like, there's no way that a player should be able to pull the goalie's legs apart so that the other player can slide the puck through yeah. and that that, and, and that they review it of all the bad goalie interference calls that they've reviewed. That is the one I, I don't, that's got to be the worst. I don't know how that was ever allowed to count. And I think that, you know, I think that was kind of a turning point too with the officiating a lot that year that it seemed like, and it still seems like in a lot of times, although this last season wasn't quite so bad, is that it seemed like the league was against the Oilers. And like, I know probably every team says that, but the, not last year, not, not the season that got ended just now, but um, the one from the year before is that we lost 21 of our of our calls when there was an interference call or whatever, yeah. fully interference. We lost 21 of them out of like 27 or something. It I was mean, crazy. That's not possible in real life, you know, like, <laughs> so it had to be something, you know, <laughs> I don't know, in the water or whatever. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I think that was, I mean, to lose that way that year was really terrible but at the same time Mm -hmm. it gave us an idea of what could happen and I think you know even going back to when we got Connor because again going back to when he was drafted um, we had talked about there was nothing to look forward to that year you know the season ended another crappy season and you know, oh no, here we go again. And how many more years are we going to pay out this money? And I remember Brian working, my husband working out that we had saved something like $43,000 or something over the last 10 years that they had. Oh, geez. And, you know, that, that kind of put it in a little bit different perspective. Yeah, no kidding. And, and then we got Connor and it was kind of like, okay, you know, like we have a chance now, maybe doing something. And, oh. and you know, that last year at Rexall and, and started, you know, the momentum started and, you kind of thought, okay, we're getting, like, we have a few really good players now. And, you know, it's just the beginning of, of, of another Gretzky, Messier, low era. And, kind of and let's hope that it really is oh, because I they, know. you know, they have the two superstars in place and some other really good pieces as well. But if Ken Holland can fill out the rest of the roster with sufficient talent, they have the team that could eventually win a Stanley Cup. And I and I believe that they're headed in that right direction. Their young defense is really impressive and they got a lot of guys coming. So I'm I'm encouraged. But you, you did make me think of something else there too. Uh that that last game when Connor hit the hundred point mark. Uh I was in Toronto and there was a, a Canuck fan in my in my class that I kind of would go back and forth with with little jabs about a, you know the the Oilers Canucks rivalry and I, I remember Connor was at, I think, 97 points with two games to go, and they played the Canucks the last two games of the year. And he got one point in the game in Vancouver, so he needed two points that final game against the Canucks. And he I think he got one in the second period and one in the third period. And when he got that point to finally, I think it was on a Drake Kajula goal, to finally hit 100 points, you know, just a, a miraculous finish too. He needed something like 25 points in the last 14 games to get there. And when he finally hit 100, everyone in the building was chanting MVP, MVP. Yeah. Yeah. And I was I was watching it. I didn't even have a TV in my, uh, in my student dorm where I was living. So I was watching it on my laptop, you know. So to, to even watch it on... on a, a 17 inch screen like it was it was incredible but right. you were that you were there live right i was there and oh wow this is too much information but i had to pee so bad <laughs> in the third period and i didn't want to leave because the lineups in between periods were ridiculous so oh it's crazy so and that that's before they added more washrooms right like oh, they've they've but, they've renovated well, and added more they did but that was just terrible. I had to go so badly, but there was no way I wanted to leave because I knew the minute I walked out that he would score. And so I lasted until he managed to get that goal and I beetled upstairs really fast. You ran, yeah. ran for the doors. You know but what, that, though? You probably... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, everyone was probably so into the game that you didn't have to wait in any lineups. No, I didn't. I got right in and right out again. But <laughs> was is that playoff. So... That was the first year Rogers was open, and and I can tell you lots of horrible things about Rogers, but 
the, that year, I go upstairs in the first playoff game to go to the bathroom. And the bathroom that I would used all season was now a man's bathroom. And I thought, okay, that's crazy. I'm sitting in my season tickets. I'm going to the same bathroom I always went to, but now it's a man's. I had to walk almost three quarters of the way around the arena to find a woman's bathroom. And so I tweeted about it during the game. I said, what the hell? You know, like, Rogers has changed the women's bathrooms into men's bathrooms. And there's a woman who is a, quite a political person here in Edmonton that's on Twitter all the time that we follow each other. And she said, what? <laughs> so then she tweeted it out. And she was, she was, she, her seats were in the lower area. And her husband was at the game. She wasn't. And so she said to him, go check and see if they've done this. And they had. They had changed half the bathrooms to men's bathrooms because the men were complaining that they were missing the hockey game. Well, then don't drink so much beer. Exactly. You know. <laughs> have the bathrooms, you know? And it was ridiculous. And there was a big bathroom controversy about it for a, a week or so here in Edmonton. Um, about the I would agree with you. I mean, <laughs> there's just, it's it's sometimes crazy how people will rush to the, the beer stand to, you know, get get two drinks just because the lines are so long. And you know, when when the when the beers there are fourteen dollars each, I'm surprised that they actually sell as many as they do. And they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a drinker, so I I can't uh, I can't confirm one way or another. But I'll take your word for it. Well, I don't drink. We well, because we can't afford to drink very often when you're at the game after you've paid all the money for the tickets. But um, yeah, it's not something I do very often either. But whatever but i remember that game being so annoyed at having to race halfway around the arena to find a bathroom it, it's just crazy it, that's part of the crazy things that were going on i think that started to really turn us off the whole season ticket thing but i have oh. to tell you a little story if you don't mind about connor no i love to hear all the stories i feel like you know i could probably talk to you all night we've <laughs> we've gone over an hour and just this is this is great conversation i hope that you'll come back and chat with me again sometime oh, too anytime now that i know how to use skype anytime yeah um, <laughs> but the, the year that we were um hoping to get connor um i had to go to a conference the night of the I was at a conference the whole day and night of the draft and Doug and Brian were here at the house and they were watching it. And my phone was on most of the day and I'd been taking pictures and recording things and doing different things. And, and so it was about quarter after six, 20 after six. And we were, the meal was being served and it was a genealogy um, family history kind of conference. So there were I'll say older people that probably same age as I am, but kind of stayed, you know, busy kind of people. And I'm sitting in this dinner and I get a text from Brian or Doug, one of them saying, We're down to the last three. And I went, Oh my God, you know, I can't believe this is happening. And Brian sent me a text, and I think it was around 6 30 that night, said, We got number one. And my phone went dead because it died, the battery died. And I thought, oh my God, did we? And I look around the room and not one person is doing anything. They're just eating their meals and they're eating their meal and carrying on and, and nobody was paying any mind to what was happening. And my heart was going 100 miles an hour. And so as soon as I could, I left and went out to my vehicle to plug my phone in to make sure that I had understood the text properly. And the first text that came back up after that was from my brother saying, the hockey gods have fixed that. That's what happened. He lives in Toronto. And I have laughed about that ever since because clearly he didn't think that we deserved to get Connor. And we did. And that was the first, the first three or four texts I got after that when my phone started charging up were all from Toronto telling me how horrible we were and how we fixed it and we jinxed it. And, you know, the oh, gods yeah. all this kind of stuff. So I, I heard all the same stuff and yeah. and you know what I and look I didn't go to Toronto until about almost two years after uh Connor was drafted by the Oilers mm -hmm. but even when I was there and I would hear that from uh people who I was I mean I was in a sports broadcasting class so everyone yeah. there is invested in sports and 
basically everyone who I was around loved the Leafs, except for, save for maybe a, a few people. But when they found out I was an Oilers fan and they would give me crap about taking their hometown boy and he, you know, he's yeah. a Toronto kid, he should be a Leaf. It w- and you hear the same things that it was fixed. And I would always say, yes, that was the NHL's intention. They wanted to take this generational once in a lifetime star and put him in a small Western Canadian city. That that is exactly what the NHL wanted to do. Like, why have him in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago? No, they wanted him at Edmonton. So, like, it's it's a it's a ridiculous argument to to say that that's what the you could argue that Edmonton might be one of the last places that they would want Connor to go, just from a, a pure marketing standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's it's ludicrous to to suggest that, but that is just them taking out their frustration because they've Oilers had already had three first round picks in recent years first overall picks i should say yeah. and now here comes arguably the greatest player since mario lemieux and he's going to edmonton so there was there was going to be a lot of a lot of frustration from toronto people but you know what too bad yeah he, he's an oiler and he's ours yeah. and all and these he pe- wants to be here like i mean and he wants to be there home. He wouldn't have signed. He wouldn't have signed a eight-year, hundred million dollar deal. And and Connor always reminds us, like you know what? I remember it was at the Rogers Cup. I think two years ago, he he was in Toronto at at the tennis event, yeah. and there was a reporter who asked him, um, like, what do you uh, what do you think about the 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 Leafs' chances? Do you think that they have a good year? Like it's a ridiculous question to ask, like a a, a player in another team, but they have to get their Leafs content in it. And he's like, "Oh, I, I says I really don't care." And it's just, it's those, it's those moments where he, you just show like he is so dedicated and focused. And I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've seen any of that new Michael Jordan documentary that everyone's talking about. Uh, I, okay, I just finished it, and you know, I, I will remember the tail end of Jordan's uh, career in the NBA, but just, just very barely, and. I, I didn't necessarily know all the stuff that went on uh, in his mindset or behind the scenes with him, but there are, there are different personalities, but Jordan's drive to win is so similar to Connor's. And I think Connor just has this intense, just focus that he, he wants to win more than anything. And he is just, his, his life mission is to bring a Stanley cup to Edmonton. And, and you know what, that's what I want to see more than anything too. So our dreams are perfectly in line now. <laughs> Mine too. But, and, and I think that he, you know, I mean, to give his parents all the credit in the world, because they seem like great people, an extremely great young man and all, you know, all around a young man is that they, like, I remember the story. I don't, I don't remember the, all of the story, but something about when he first got traded to the Erie Otters and they were a last place team or something and yeah. he wasn't very happy about it. He was 14 years old or whatever and wanted to be on a winning team. And his dad said, buck up, you know, you're playing on this team and you're going to have to make them better. And I think Wayne had something to do as, as well as some connection with Wayne in there. But his parents, you know, like, you're not quitting, like, just because you didn't get the team you wanted kind of deal. And I think that held true even I mean, I don't know when he was being drafted if he really wanted to play for the Leafs or whoever. Like he's a kid who grew up playing hockey well, and catching, he, you know, he, and probably He was would. a Leafs fan. He yeah, he's exactly. I mean he's talked about he was a Toronto fan growing up. You oh, know God, he changed. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Toronto fans love there's this picture of him uh when he's eight years old on Christmas morning getting a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey for Christmas. And and Leaf fans love to share that photo. Uh, they'll they'll post it any time there's there's an opportunity to take a shot at Oilers fans. But yeah, that's exactly it. When he did get drafted to the Erie Otters, you know he he wanted to get that exceptional player status so that he could play a year early. And when he did get that that status, he went first overall, and he went to a terrible franchise that isn't in Ontario. So now you're moving to Erie, Pennsylvania, which is further outside of the all the teams that are sort of bunched together. I mean, you know, Southern Ontario better than I do how there's so many teams in such a, a a small area. Like it's, it's all drivable within a few hours, I believe for, for most of those cities. And now you're going not just over the border, but all the way down to Pennsylvania. Like you're, you're going to be in for a lot of long road trips up to Ontario and back. And 
like you said, going to a, a, a last place team, it, it probably was frustrating for a 15 year old kid, but look, they made it in his, he was there for three years and they made it to the championship series in his last year. So he, he turned around that franchise and hopefully he's going to turn around this Oilers franchise too. Well, and I see two or three of them being like him and dry are really good friends and I know him and, and Darnell are. And, yeah. and I, that those that core, you know, those and and you know a few other ones, Clefbaum and um, and now Ethan Bear, although he's a little bit younger than they are. Like my God, you know, they definitely, if they continued playing, I mean, I think they would have made the playoffs without all of this thing that's going on. How they're going to decide it all now? But I mean, I think if the game, if the season had continued, they would have at least made the playoffs, and and hopefully would have gone even well. further. I'm still holding out hope that that they will be able to resume the season. And obviously you live closer to the situation, but Edmonton wants to be a hub city and host playoff games for multiple teams. Um, We have no idea what the next few months hold, but I'm remaining hopeful that they are going to find a way to quarantine the players and figure out a solution to finish this season, even if it means starting the season late next year. It sounds like they've already talked about extending it to November or December. Yeah, so. that's what I heard. Yeah, I'd heard that too. And yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think that I, I'm optimistic, especially now, like, because it's been brought up a few times, um, you know, in the afternoon when our, um, our premier, who I won't even go into, but, um, you know, our, our medical officer, um, Dr. Henshaw, like she's been asked for the last six weeks, is there any chance? Is there any chance? And and it's gradually gotten a little bit more positive in terms of what they're viewing and how they may be able to do it and that they're working with different people to figure out how they could do it. And, and the ice district, um, as expensive as it all is down there, I mean, it's a perfect hub for, because literally you could be in the hotel and in the, in the arena without going outside, you know? And so, I mean, if they had to do something along those lines, you know, certainly this is a place that that would be able to accommodate all of that within that one little area of the city and, you know, stick a dome over the top, whatever you need to do. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I think it would be awesome and, you know, and, and be able to, with all of us, be able to watch it on TV again. I think yeah, that and this whole COVID thing became real is when they canceled the NHL, to be really honest. Oh, definitely. You know, I think everybody um, that was kind of, you know. Well, I remember it was between intermission of the Oilers Jets game on March 12th when they announced that the NBA had suspended play for their season. And I think that's when it started to sound like, okay, well, this is this is not going to be just an NBA issue. The NHL is going to follow suit. And and they did shortly after. And here here we are now and it's been over two months since the Oilers last played, and I'm, I'm hopeful it's not going to be too much longer. I mean, I, I, I jokingly say we're used to not watching hockey at this time of year, but this felt like a year where they were supposed to be playing in May. Exactly. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And I I mean, I think the, the sports channels have been great playing all the old games, but I think it's just hyped people up even more that they want oh, it back. Right? Absolutely. And I, I mean, to I was so looking forward to getting to – come out to Edmonton and watch some playoff games this year. Because like I said, in, in tw- uh, 2006, I was in high school and didn't have a car. So it was not possible for me to uh, come out and see games. And I didn't have right. a, even a job at the time. So I had no money to do it. And then in 2017, I was in Toronto. So once again, didn't have a chance. But this was going to be the year I was going to finally come out. And for unfortunately, even if the season is uh, resumed there won't be fans in the building so it, i'll it's terrible because this is the first year we haven't had tickets you know since okay the very beginning and it was like oh god they're gonna get in the playoffs and i'm gonna they're connor's gonna be carrying that damn cup around and i'm not gonna get to see it in person and so there's a little part of me and i hope people don't hate me for it but there's a little part of me that's thinking oh good if connor gets to carry it around everybody will be in the same boat as i am yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, you know what? There's there's all these people saying now, well, if, if whoever does win, there's going to be an asterisk on it or it's not going to be a real championship. But you know what? In 95, when the Devils won and in 2013, when the Blackhawks won, those were lockout shortened mm-hmm. seasons. Yep. And looking back now, no one ever says, oh, well, the 2013 Blackhawks, they weren't really Stanley Cup champions because they only played a 48 game season. All that gets lost in translation over time, and you you forget that it even was a shortened season. Except, it's just you were still the champion. Except if 
Edmonton wins, then everybody will say that. For Edmonton fans, though, if Toronto wins, we would yeah. say, you know, like, I it, mean, we have to be honest here. You know, but, the, you know that's going to be the narrative, especially out east, that, you know, that it, it wasn't a real championship or yeah. something like that. But I actually think the Oilers are poised to do very well if they get back in, just because they are such a young team and everyone will be healthy at this point. I, I like their chances against Calgary or Vancouver. Vegas could be a little tougher to get out of the second round, but they this is a team that has a chance to to do some damage, and I, I hope we get the chance to, oh, to see do. that happen this summer. The only thing that bothers me a little bit, and it, it, it I don't know if it's – I talked to my girlfriend who's a real Euler fan as well, and we were chatting about it, is that I really wanted the Oilers to win the Stanley Cup at, at Rogers, and – that's our home, right? And if if we're in the playoffs and did lose the last game and did lose the Stanley Cup at our arena, that's one thing. But to have two other teams, if Oilers didn't make it into the last series, to have two other teams buy for the Stanley Cup in our home barn, this kind of that I, I have to get used to that. Well, I don't have to get used to that. I think the Oilers <laughs> would be there. But you know what I'm saying? Like it kind of taints it a little bit to me. Well, I, maybe I'm being kind of silly, but. I mean, the way I look at it, they've talked about doing four hub cities, right? Yeah. So it would make sense that you would send all the teams from the Pacific Division to Edmonton. For yeah. example, like you'd send Vegas, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton. Now, after that series is finished, like or those two rounds are finished, we'll say either, I mean, I'm not going to be hopeful for the Canucks or Flames, but to say the Oilers are, or the the golden Knights uh, end up winning that second round. It makes you, th- it makes you think, okay, well, if Edmonton wins, then it would make sense to continue playing there. But if right. Vegas, if Vegas wins, then it's more likely that they would just go back to the States and rejoin one of the other hub cities. I know they've talked about North Dakota, uh, a city in New Hampshire, yeah, South Carolina. So I, I, I I'm not exactly a hundred percent sure that, it would continue to play in Edmonton, but obviously those discussions haven't been happening yet. Maybe they would continue to play in Edmonton just because there aren't as many COVID cases there as other places. Yeah. But I, that, to me, that just crossed my mind that it wouldn't make sense unless Edmonton is still playing. It wouldn't make sense to continue using a that's, Canadian city. Yeah, that's a good point. But yeah, it's just one of those silly things that you think about and think. Hmm, yeah, you like know? you'd hate to see the Flames do it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because the Oilers, the Oilers have been to seven Stanley Cup Finals, won five of them, but the two that they lost, they lost them both on the road. Yeah. So the, the the Stanley Cup has never been handed out to a visiting team in uh, in our building. So exactly. it's yeah. uh and it's crazy to think that yesterday was the the 36th anniversary of of the first Stanley Cup. So it's, yeah. um, I I did I wanted to ask you early in the podcast, but I'll ask now: Is that your favorite Oiler memory, the first Stanley Cup, or or do you have another like one singular memory at, 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 from attending an Oiler game that stands out to you? God, I think I think that they're all really special. I you know to be honest, I. I'm trying. I I don't even know if there's one special one. Um, Were you at the game when he broke Gordie Howe's record, Gretzky, when he was with no, the Kings? I, I no, you weren't. Was. Okay. No. Um, no, I wasn't. But um, you 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 were there for some of the Stanley Cup games. Yeah. Oh, definitely. definitely. Oh. It's, it's, well, now I'm even more jealous of you, Cheryl. Well, I I think it's really weird though because you're thinking about it, and I I can really remember more recent things. But you know, that's to me like it's a long time ago, and there were so many other things. Going of course. On. Um, you know, cause I mean, I, obviously I was a mom and working and doing all those things. So hockey was just part of it. Um, where now as I'm like that, I'm older, I can kind of spend more time remembering and looking at it kind of thing now. And I mean, I look at pictures that we've taken over the years and things like that. And, you know, from way back when they did win those Stanley Cups, I got an awesome picture with me and uh, Mark Messe with his black eye and. Um, as I said earlier, the pictures of Trev and, and Wayne and Pockington and Doug with Dougie Waite and my daughter with, with, you know, Mark Messier and different players. And I've got a picture of her standing beside the Stanley Cup, which I think was, I think she was two. So she, it would have been probably the 85, maybe. 
okay um, yeah that they won and and mark had brought it out to the Bruin inn and uh and left it in the lobby with his brother <laughs> So that because a whole bunch of kids and people had seen him come in with it so they had all come down to the Bruin and of course the Bruin's a, par, a bar so kids can't go in there but they were allowing them in the lobby and I have a picture of my daughter standing beside the Stanley Cup she's not even as tall as the Stanley Cup and oh, wow. uh, and Mark signed it for her later on when she met him a few years later she he signed it well, not a few years later I mean a few years when she's growing up and she showed him the picture and he signed the picture for her but um, so, I mean, I've got those kind of memories, you know, as opposed to actually being at a game, more the kind of things that were happening around it and, and you know, meeting them and seeing, being with the cup and stuff like that. Yeah. It, you know, it's kind of, now, I had the same opportunity in Toronto when the Toronto Maple Leafs won those tennis <laughs> games because I had that, somewhere there was a picture. Of, my brother has searched for it and he can't find it, but I um. I have I, there was a picture of me with the Stanley Cup at Maple Leaf Gardens. Okay. Um, when they had the party, but I do have the picture of Frank Mahovlich and his wife beside the Stanley Cup, taken in the lobby of the Maple Leaf Gardens toward the party they had afterwards. So, God, that's a long time ago. <laughs> you know what? Well, yeah, I mean that would have been '67, their last yeah. cup. So, yeah. and I hope that that I hope that that cup drought continues on a a little longer <laughs> or a I lot longer. But they're my brother and his kids if they won. Like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, my my first time touching the Stanley Cup was in the summer of 2004 when um, Corey Sarich, who's from Saskatoon, he won the Cup with Tampa Bay. And I always say that was a double good summer because, number one, uh, the Flames lost in the Stanley Cup final. So the, the so the Tampa Bay Lightning did a good job for, uh, for Oilers fans. And then secondly, uh, there happened to be a guy from Saskatoon who played – uh, his junior hockey here as well, and he brought the Stanley Cup back to uh, to my city, and I got to uh, take a a picture with it with my dad, and uh, that that's one of my great memories. And so I always say uh, it was uh, it worked out uh, it worked out two times for me that year, and uh, yeah, sure. I'm 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 very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, it you know I think that's it. There's so many memories they kind of all blend together, and you're trying like uh, when you're asking, you know, kind of trying to think, okay you know for what, sure what, those kind of things but um you know there's just lots of memories that you know i have but a lot of them aren't necessarily on the ice specific they're involving it but not specific on the ice so. and you alluded to that earlier of what a community team it was and how they, much they were involved in the city so it, it makes sense that maybe some of the on because there were records upon records happening at that time maybe they all blend together after a while but when you're able to sort of see and f touch these people and just kind of be around them and just yeah. feel like you're a part of it. That those are probably going to be the things that maybe stick out to you even more. Oh, definitely. And I think that's for me, you know, again, just maybe it's my age or whatever, but that's what sticks out. Oh, you're, you're only as, you're only as old as you feel is what my mom always says. So, <laughs> but it's, all I can say it is. There's me in the mirror every so often. So I'm like, oh, yeah. wrong, you know, <laughs> Well, all, all I can say is I hope that in my lifetime I get to experience one fifth of the Oilers' success that you got to experience. So, I'm 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 hopeful that the next generation is going to get to at least see somewhat of what it was like to be a fan during those glory years. And you did such a wonderful job of describing it and uh, sharing some of those thoughts. I feel like I could talk to you all night, Cheryl, but <laughs> I, sh I feel like I should end it now and um, we'll uh, hopefully have a chance to talk more in the future. Hopefully when hockey is resumed and I'll get a chance to see you at another Oilers live cup and uh, maybe share some more fun memories and stories uh, the next time we chat. I'm here, Eric, anytime you need me. That's great. Well, I want to thank you again. This was episode 14. It's one of my favorite numbers, too. Uh, I was a number I wore for most of my hockey career. And Jordan Eberle, one of my favorite players, who's also from Saskatchewan, wore it. So I, I thank you for joining me for a, a special uh, episode anyway. I appreciate it, Eric. Thank you so much for inviting me. For sure. So for Cheryl Stewart, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out. <laughs>